Um, a while ago, I spoke about Walk the Cross, this great initiative that um, Anto Crossy is leading in Ireland, where we will meet on Saturday, the 16th of September in Clonmacnoise, and we will mark it by walking the cross 33 miles in all the directions. Everything being worked out, fever, feverishly working this out, getting the details together. Uh, and uh, I do encourage everybody to please support Walk the Cross. Not my idea, but our Lord wants this. I don't know why. Exactly, I don't know why yet, but I suppose in time it will unfold. But I just wanted to slot something into this Walk the Cross that happened to me the day I got confirmation from our Lord that he wanted me to help Anto to organise Walk the Cross. As you remember, I said I was in adoration in Knock, in Ireland's Eucharistic Shrine. I was the only one there in adoration. And our Lord said to me that Anto would give me a call. I leave the adoration chapel and I go across the road to the Divine Mercy bookshop. And I met a lady there. Her name is Monica. And she will remember the conversation that I was going into that bookstore before Anto gave me the call that our Lord said he was going to give me. So between the adoration chapel and the and the bookstore i was about to take a picture of the cross but just winding back a few minutes in that bookstore a famous jesuit had a miraculous i would say impulse or appearance in this uh whole thing about walk the cross very bizarrely because monica and she will remember this conversation. We were there talking. We had met before. And she uh, she pointed to a book. And she said, do you know what, Robert? You should buy that book. I said, oh, yeah, I should buy that book. And what was the book that, you know, I happened to buy just before taking the picture of the cross and Anto giving me the call? What was the book I bought? Well, this was the book I bought. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Church by Malachi Martin. Minor person in the church. Happened to be a Jesuit. I spoke about things that seem to be happening at this very moment in the church. You know, he was a Jesuit that stood up for what controversial people would say. Hard to make him out. Hard to read as a personality. But you read his books. And you do th keep th wondering. Hmm. We seem to be living during a time when a lot of what he was talking about is coming to pass. Malik, Ma Martin's vision is upsetting as he depicts cardinals who place financial, political and diplomatic issues on par with spiritual concerns in determining the outcome of the crucial election. <laughs> the decline and fall of the Roman Church. I don't know why we're doing the walk to cross exactly at this time in September, but I do know in, in October we will begin this famous synod and synodality and the Irish delegation will bring to Rome a document that was prepared in Ireland. I've said it before. And I don't know how many times I've read it through. The only thing that I can say about that particular synodal document prepared by this you know consensus in Ireland to this whatever it's purely demonic it's like giving an apology to Satan oh I'm sorry Lucifer that we held a deposit of the faith I'm sorry that we called people to live to be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect we all fall short we all sin but we don't live there we strive to improve ourselves we strive for virtue but at this moment in time in the Irish church, our leaders, our bishops, our pastors and our priests, many of the time, don't call us or even propose the option of living virtuously, of proposing virtue to the church, of calling us to live, to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect, to bring us on that road to perfection, road to sanct of sanctification, road, road of holiness, a process you start off and you work towards perfecting yourself. That's what our Lord did. You know, he picks up these fishermen and he brings them on a journey to become saints, to lead, to change their lives, to change their mind, to change the way they live. 
And yet today in the Irish church, sadly, um, you know, after so many years of, of, of laxity, let's say, in the spiritual life, you know, we, we, we've ended up with, we're not able to stand up and say, do you know what? I think the deposit of the faith is worth teaching, preaching, living, proclaiming. Yesterday we saw, we saw the flame being lit on slain. And instead of looking over at the hill of Tara, you could look over at the hill of, at Dublin, at the pagan Dublin, the pagan Dublin now, our overlords in Ireland, the or our overlords that have pushed abortion, 30,000 abortions since, since um, that demonic referendum was passed. And no sooner had 6,666 abortions been published in the newspapers in early 2020, we kicked off with 6, 666 days and six hours of restrictions in which the church was only too happy to bow down to the government. Please shut us. Please render us non-essential. Okay, after a, a few weeks, four or five, you know, we we give our, our leaders, our church leaders, the benefit of the doubt at the beginning. You know, we didn't know what we didn't know. But as the months and months and months dragged on, and we plastered hand sanitizer over ourselves and masked ourselves up and distanced ourselves, even though the rest of the workforce weren't doing anything like this. We were all able to go to restaurants and eat, but we couldn't sit in a church and uh, eat the body of our Lord and be strengthened by the body of our Lord. And I think church leaders see the craziness of what went on in the pandemic. But we come out of the pandemic we put together a synodal document in which, in reality, you know, if you read through it a few times, you'll see that, you know, there are calls for the church to apologise for their teachings on sexuality and morality. You know, who are you to tell us who we can have sex with or what form or with who or blah, blah, blah. You know, what's the purpose of our sexuality? It's whatever we think it is. And the church has no say or shouldn't even have a teaching on it, or propose a teaching. And we'll continue to marry people who've lived together. We won't even propose to them uh, the option of um, you know, living apart before they get married, or propose to them the chastity. Now, we all fall short. We, all, we are all sinners. We are all sinners, and there's no, no point in saying it otherwise. But we have to propose a way of perfection, perfection so people can embark on that path of perfection know the road that christ is leading us show people the road offer it to them preach it live it show people how to pray if you read the synodal document it doesn't talk about teaching enabling fostering people to pray it doesn't talk about this what's not in that synodal document is very telling because it's it's a demonic document. That's I can only say it in those words. You've gone out to an uncatechized Irish population and you've asked them what they think the church should be. And of course, people who don't know the faith will give you the uncatechized answer. In my diocese here in Kilala, we didn't have a synodal process. So there was no synodal consultation. They had one back in 2018 in which we weren't allowed to be part of, which is fine. But at least we, we, we were spared in this diocese a synodal consultation. So there was no possibility to have even our voice heard. And in many places around Ireland, that was the same thing. We just saw it for what it was. The left, the left's takeover of the church. Pure and simple. That's what we was. You know, and you, you raise a question. Okay, guys, you're discussing something here which has never been part of the church's teaching for 2000 years. I was the church got it right all the time. No, we, the church is made up of men and women. But at the end of the day, we have to turn to what our Lord left us. And it was strange. I was in adoration today. Went to, ch to, to knock today. Um, somebody mentioned that Sister Breed was giving a talk, but there was a talk after mass, but there was some other, she was going to give a holy hour, but I suppose I, I got, I got it muddled up anyway. And uh, so anyway, I went to adoration and I was in prayer 
looking at our Lord and the Blessed Eucharist, present body, blood, soul and divinity. And out of the Eucharist was coming like, how can I explain it? It was like the unfolding of, of the Bible. It was like the Bible unfolded all of the pages of sacred scripture unfolded and the whole chapel end to end was plastered with with the whole word of God and uh, you know because when we when we encounter Christ in in the Eucharist we also encounter his word his word becomes alive for us so like if you if you consume the Eucharist with faith then you read the Gospels. They take on a whole different color. Or, I don't know. They, they, the, his word speaks in a different way when you read it. When you read the Bible, the Gospels especially, the New Testament, uh, and you eat his body and drink his blood in the Eucharist, you know, the, the word becomes alive. And I think in the church, we have lost the capacity to preach his word. We have literally lost it to propose his word you know christ talks talks to men to men specifically and he says if you even look at a woman uh, with lust in your heart you've committed adultery you know and today because we're not able to even say that oh no no pornography is just not a sin anymore man that's just, it's just don't be worrying about those things. We're not even to stand up and preach this. And this is the literal word of our Lord who calls us to act in a different way, to perfect yourselves in a different way. And uh, I pray every day that the delegation from Ireland doesn't go to Rome to this synod. I, I hope and pray that our Lord will intervene to stop that demonic synodal document from Ireland ever reaching or being read out in Rome. I think it is the most horrific thing that I've ever read from an Irish church and how our hierarchy and our leadership, who should know better, even allowed it to be compiled. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely sad to see the faith being treated with such disrespect in Ireland. And no matter how many times I've thought about it, meditated on it, you know, I, I don't want to create division. But the division is coming in the church. Not just me. Other people have seen the same vision. The same. And our Lord is, uh, is crying unity, unity. He's offering us the unity prayer. How many people are getting the same thing in, in, in prayer? Unity, unity, unity. Why is our Lord asking for unity? Because the, the disunity is coming. In the church. The storm is coming. How many times? This is Medjugorje. Even the storm yesterday over slain, the storm today, the storm is coming. It's not over liturgy. It's over the deposit of the faith. Ah, oh, we'll bless this. It's okay. You know, it's fine. You don't need to be breeding like rabbits anymore. You know, just, just capitulate to the world. The climate crisis, population control. Just capitulate. Let's give in. Let's give a little bit over to, to this kingdom down here. You know, we don't talk about sexual morality. If, you, if your conscience says this, then you should do what your conscience says. We don't have a deposit of faith, so we're not going to really preach that anymore. I kid you not, this is where we're heading, guys. It's exactly what this dead Jesuit has been telling us for years. This dead Irish Jesuit. A dead Irish Jesuit leaving his legacy. And who would have guessed that, what, 25 years he wrote about, 20, well, 30 years ago, he, he's, we see playing out in the church today because that Irish Jesuit knew where we were heading and we've arrived. The storm is here. We're about to be engulfed in it. And there will be a few bishops that will stand up in this synodal process. You know, you, you're either a bishop or you're not. Stand up. You either preach the faith or know the faith or you never knew the faith. If you're not able to stand up. Um, you know, all the bishops folded under Henry VIII in, in England. Bar very, very few of them. John Fisher. You know, very, it's amazing how many bishops just, oh, we'll just capitulate. 
to this king. I'm sure when he's gone, this king, we'll see what happens with the next king and maybe we, things will sort themselves out. And it was only very, very few that actually stood up with, do you know what? The faith is this. It's not what King, king Henry is telling us. The faith is what it is. So how many Irish bishops are going to stand up and tell us, but do you know what? It might be uncomfortable for us to say this, but the deposit of the faith is what it is. And we ask you to to know it more, to, to, to enter into this mystery of, of the faith, which calls us to change the way we live our lives. We are all sinners, but Christ is in our midst and he asks us to change our our minds our lives to align ourselves with him to be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect why did christ even say that if perfection wasn't possible to be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect to live as christ calls us to live as his spirit inspires us to live and the holy spirit can't be inspiring <laughs> that's very strange that's very strange. <laughs> Some message. The Holy Spirit can't be inspiring in two different camps in two different ways. The Spirit in inspires us to be united. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm just giving this because somehow from beyond the grave, a Jesuit rises up to remind us about the deposit of the faith and to point out we are heading for the decline and fall of the Roman church if we allow this synodal process to take its course as it's currently standing. You know, that, a, that you can go in and appoint lay people and whoever you like to a synod that will have voting structures. I mean, what is the purpose of a bishop anymore? <laughs> Like, I honestly think, what is the vocation and purpose of a bishop? What is? You know, it's all very nice to consult us laity, and I fully think it's great that you're here for us at the end of the day, but a bishop has his vocation. He has apostolic succession. He's supposed to, to hold the apostolic deposit of the faith and to guard it, to safeguard it, and to pass it on. You know, a lay woman or a lay man, you know, we're not the successors of the apostles. You know, we can advise, we can help, we can build up the church, but it's up to our bishops to safeguard the deposit of the faith. And clearly, clearly what is in this Irish synodal document is not the deposit of the faith in any shape or form. It's even, they're even calling for an apology on, on how we've taught our faith in the past, you know. You know, inclusion. We we are going to be so inclusive now in the church. We'll have Satan sitting among us, and we'll welcome him because we we have to be so inclusive that Lucifer has to have a place at the table. It seems the way we're going. So like. <laughs> I suppose I've thought about it. I've meditated on this so many times and you don't want to ruffle feathers. You don't want to cause division. And our Lord is, is calling us to unity. And he has said to me, don't divide my church. But he's also asking me to lead, to wake up, to speak out. You know, we have a deposit of the faith. We have a gospel. His word is there. Why would he show me his word? In that way, in adoration, he's calling us to renew the faith. He's calling us to be bold, and to stand up and to preach what we know to be true. Either Christ is the way, the truth and life. Or what? You know, and it's I, I hope and pray. I hope and pray that this synodal process doesn't start in October. And if it does, that somehow our, this, our, this Irish document doesn't make it to be even spoken about in Rome. I think it's a shameful thing that we would even allow this to be put up there, something to be discussed. To be discussed for what? You know, what do we stand for? What does our faith stand for? What did Christ stand for? What was the even purpose of his crucifixion if, you know, if all we turn around and say to him, sorry, Lord, Lord you, do you know what you got wrong about, about calling us to, uh, to be... Um, 
to live in monogamous marriage and only marry uh, uh, to only have marriage between a man and a woman and not to be looking at pornography you got it wrong you know it's you lived 2000 years ago lord sure we can we do things differently today we have different we have different golden calves that we bow down to today and you know we need to make room for these in the church now this is where we're heading anyway pray for the church pray for the church Pray for the soul of Maliki Martin. A Jesuit speaks from the grave. <laughs> this was the book that I bought just before I took the photo of the cross, just before Anto Crossy called me. Why? Why was this book placed in my hand? Literally told to buy it. You should buy this. Well, the church is not a democracy. And we can't just vote in what we like and change what we like. And preach what we like. Either there is a deposit of the faith. Or there isn't a deposit of the faith. Either we have sacred scripture. The word of God. Or we don't. You know. And um, you know, it seems like we're on this uh, trajectory now. To uh, to preach something different. I, I, I was looking at the World Youth Day. And people were saying. Oh you're very negative on, on what went on in Portugal. Blah blah blah. Well, you know, and you see the Blessed Eucharist stored in plastic crates in a tent, you know, with very little. You know, no. when you see that and you see um, the Eucharist being given out at a Spanish mass in uh, Ikea bowls and you see the the rave, the, 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 the Portuguese DJ. You know, we're just as cool as the world now. You know, let's do a rave. Let's let's put in Pope Francis a little bit in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I was wondering, is this photoshopped? And they said, no, this is really what was happening. And I said, okay, okay. Um, you know, World Youth Day, and we're not even, you know, we're like guys. Where are we going? Where are the leaders? Where are our Where are our shepherds? Where are our shepherds? Where are the leaders that sh that that sh should stand up and say, "Holy Father, you have got this process wrong." You know, we were ordained as the successors of the apostles to transmit the deposit of the faith in good se in season and out of season, and it's time now that the bishops stand up and and just calmly tell us what is the deposit of the faith, because they, a lot of them seem very 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 silent. In the face of what we're uh, we're all asking, a lot of laity are asking. Hold on a second, you have a synodal document there. Do you believe that? Do you want? Do you want that? Do you believe this? And what what do you believe? What do bishops believe sometimes? Honestly, you know we had Jesuits coming here to our parish and saying, "Well, women priests, yes, but they're they're coming." Just hold on a second. You know, you know, married priests, they're, oh, sure, they're practically approved. You know, we're, we're, you know, it's not that I have anything against married priests. There are married priests in the church. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm just, just saying, but, you know, our, where was the day that we, that people gave their lives for Christ, their efforts for Christ? I mean, you know, there's this rush for change. Because people seem to be, uh, you know, kind of annoyed with the status quo. It's not, it's not engaging. You know, if we were more modern, we'd have more people in church. Uh, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's to drive a conversation in Ireland. Do bishops actually believe in the deposit of the faith? Because I remember after that synodal document came out in Ireland, there was only one bishop that timidly spoke up about that synodal document you know what wasn't in that document was more telling than what was in the document it's the liberal takeover of the Irish church really you know we're afraid to stand up and preach and teach the faith anyway pray for the Irish church God bless you take care bye bye